Okay, good afternoon. That sounds good. Very good. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. So, we're going to talk about exsanguinating trauma from CPR to EPR. It's going to be a tale that uh, hopefully you'll find exciting and interesting. Uh, I do have to comment that I'm a co-author of a patent for emergency preservation resuscitation method, and I'll be talking about what that method means. And we have grant support from the U.S. Department of Defense, and I'll be talking about some crazy uses of saline and cardiopulmonary bypass. So in terms of an outline for what I'm going to talk about, I'll talk very little briefly about CPR, a little bit about post-arrest hypothermia, and then get into cardiac arrest and trauma. What do, we, what do we know about that at the moment? Hypothermia and trauma, what do we know about that? And then kind of putting all this together in this concept that we call EPR, and I know that we've in the past called it suspended animation, but I'd rather stick with the EPR term. So I want to start with uh, Peter Saffer, who I had the pleasure of working with for about 20 years, um, who is known as the father of CPR. And for those of you who don't know it, the way that Peter showed that mouth-to-mouth resuscitation works is by taking anesthetized, paralyzed volunteers who happened to be, this one happened to be a surgical resident. If anybody wants to volunteer for my studies, we can meet at the bar later. Um, but an important thing here is that Peter put together, along with others, the A, B, C, D, uh, E, F, G, H, he went beyond A, B, and Cs for basic life support. And early on, he commented that H, for hypothermia, start within 30 minutes of no signs of CNS recovery. This is something that he published in 1960. So the idea has been around for a long time. So, but it took a while for it to be used in patients, mainly because back in the 60s, the feeling was that you had to cool people down to very cold temperatures to get the effect. You had to go to 28 degrees, 30 degrees. But we and others showed that cooling just to 34 made a difference, and that led to the famous hypothermic cardiac arrest trial in Europe, as well as Stephen Bernard's trial in Austria, Australia, showing that mild hypothermia could have an impact on outcome. And there's great enthusiasm, if any of you have not seen this slide before, of some enthusiastic medics in Germany who threw frozen french fries on this patient to start the cooling process outside the hospital. But we've been coming, pulling back a little bit on the enthusiasm, at least in terms of the temperature level, perhaps, uh, after recognizing that the hypothermic cardiac arrest trial normal thermal group was actually a little bit warm, which led to the targeted temperature management study comparing 33 and 36 degrees, which showed that basically there was no difference in outcomes. So right now, at least in terms of the European Resuscitation Council and our Heart Association, the recommendations are if you have somebody who's comatose after cardiac arrest, that you should induce targeted temperature management at 32 to 36 for at least 24 hours. And I'm sure we really need to do much more research to figure out who should be at 32, who should be at 36, and for how long. So there's much more, I think, to come in this area, which certainly should prevent fever also. What about trauma? People are always afraid to use hypothermia and trauma because of coagulation and other issues. But this is actually a small study. This is just six patients from the, my current institution, the Shock Trauma Center, where they had patients who were comatose after a traumatic cardiac arrest, and they showed that there was at least no complication of the hypothermia, and some of them did uh, fairly well. Now, the gist of this talk really is about what can we do for a patient who has cardiac arrest from trauma. So when I was a sur surgery resident, uh, my wife is an emergency physician, and I spent a couple months as visiting residents at the Shock Trauma Center. And little did I know then, I would come and work there 20-plus years later. Uh, but there's a patient that really stood out in my mind, a young male, had a stab wound to the heart, or some sort of argument about bowling shoes, who knew what it was. But even coming to the world-famous Shock Trauma Center, this is what the trauma resuscitation unit used to look like. It's much nicer now, of course. Uh, but we couldn't save him. And it just happened that three months after that, I went into the lab with Peter Saffer, and we started looking at, well, what can we do for these patients who have traumatic cardiac arrest? Because we know the outcomes are terrible. The issue is CPR doesn't work. If you don't have any blood in the circulation, you can pump on the chest all you want, and you're not going to get any benefit of it. In fact, there's been lots of studies showing that CPR outside the hospital for trauma patients doesn't do any good. The only thing that's good is racing as fast as you can to get to the hospital. And we know our outcomes are bad. Even if we do everything possible, we manage the airways, we open the chest, 
still survival. This is Peter Rees' review from uh, almost now 20 years ago. But survival is around 7% overall in his study. Better if it's penetrating, better if it's chest trauma. But I've looked at data from shock trauma, and it's still 5%, 7%. It's terrible. So if we have a disease process that, that is that bad, we've got to come up with something better to do to try and save these patients. Now, another important uh, piece of data that came into some of our thinking was, uh, this is Ron Bellamy from the US Army and Peter Saff were looking at data from the Vietnam War and looking at when soldiers who died of their injuries died. The important point here is there are some who died immediately. We're not going to save them. But if you look at it, there are a number of soldiers who died within five minutes, within a half an hour, an hour. And the other important thing here is they did autopsies on all of them. And a lot of them have fixable injuries. So you got a bunch of people that are dying basically in front of other people. And if you had something you could do, if you could do something to stop the clock, buy some time to get that person from point A to point B, perhaps you could save them because you have things you could fix, but you just don't have the time to fix them. So that came around to thinking, well, what can we do to decrease metabolism, decrease all the bad things that are going on with ischemia and then reperfusion to buy us that time to transport the patient and get a surgeon that can then stop the bleeding. If it's you know, compressible bleeding, that's not a problem. It's the non-compressible bleeding, torso injuries, pelvic injuries that are the ones that are killing these patients that could be fixed if the surgeon can get to them in time. So there are a number of influences that played into thinking that hypothermia could be the answer, or at least a key part of the answer. Number one, we and others were already looking at the idea of using hypothermia for improving outcomes from non-traumatic cardiac arrest, and that was already becoming something that was uh, being considered clinically. We know that there are plenty of examples of people who suffered cold water drowning and they were underwater for an hour or maybe longer than an hour, but they could still be saved if you get them out and resuscitate them. And thirdly, our cardiac surgical colleagues have been using hypothermia to allow them to do operations with total body circulatory rest for years. Now, it was surprisingly how much little data there actually was in the lab of how to do this, but they've been doing it. They knew that if they cooled the body quickly and to a certain temperatures, they could stop the circulation to work on the aorta or a tiny baby's heart for 45 minutes or even an hour, which is the kind of time we're looking at to try to do, to buy some time to save our trauma patients. So all this led us to the idea that hypothermia could be the answer, or at least very much a part of the answer. We've now turned this emergency preservation and resuscitation, thinking that EPR could be the new CPR, if we can show this works. But the concept is protection, preservation of the whole organism during circuitry arrest of two hours or more for transportation, control of bleeding, while they're still pulseless, followed by delayed resuscitation. And that hopefully this could allow survival from otherwise lethal injuries. Again, the key thing is all we're trying to do is buy time. Stop the clock so we can get from point A to point B, stop the bleeding, and resuscitate the person. Because right now at point A, we can't resuscitate them. They're still bleeding. Now, I have to step back for a second and recognize that hypothermia and trauma have this kind of yin and yang uh, relationship. On the good side, hypothermia can decrease oxygen consumption, decrease free radical productions, decrease inflammation, decrease excitatory neurotransmitters. I mean, there's a whole list of other mechanisms that are good things that hypothermia can do. The bad side is that it causes coagulopathy, although you you got to get down to at least around 30 degrees, have some clinically significant coagulation changes. But they're stressed, they're shivering. So there's definitely a downside to hypothermia. And we know that our trauma patients get cold. They're predisposed because what's the first thing we do with every trauma patient? We cut off all their clothes, right? And if we, beyond that, then we open up body cavities. So they get exposed, they get cold because of that. They've lost blood. We give them fluids that we try to warm, but often aren't that warm and they have limited ability to respond because of shock and sedation, anesthesia, whatever they've taken before they got injured, alcohol and other drugs. So our, our trauma patients get cold, and we talk in the trauma world about this triad of death, of acidosis, hypothermia, coagulopathy. And this is something that we think about as trauma surgeons of 
patients in the operating room, they're bleeding, so they get, they get more acidemic because of shock, they get more coagulopathic because of uh, the, the blood loss, and we're giving them red cells, and they're more acidemic, so they bleed some more, so they get more coagulopathic, more acidemic, so they bleed more, and they get more, you know, I can see how this cycle keeps on going. And in the trauma world, what we do is what's called damage control. All we want to do is get in and out of the operating room as fast as possible, do the minimum of what we have to do, take the patient in the to the ICU, and now warm them up, restore homeostasis, and come back to complete the operation at a later date. And we also know from retrospective studies that the higher the injury severity, the lower the temperature, and the higher the mortality. But is the temperature really affecting mortality? Or is it more just a marker of badness? And the largest study that I know of that we participated in in Pennsylvania, uh, we looked at this, a statewide trauma registry, 38,000 patients, 5% of them actually got hypothermic. And we tried to throw every possible parameter we could think of into the statistical model. Even with all that statistical gyration, we found that there's still an odds ratio of death of three. So if you got hypothermic, you were three times more likely to die than if you didn't. Again, <clears throat> this is a, an association. It's statistical. It doesn't mean it's cause and effect, but it's certainly cause for concern about what's going on with our trauma patients. But I will posit to you that there's a big difference between spontaneous or Exposure hypothermia, like Napoleon's man, he lost more men to, to battle, or not to disease and hypothermia than actually in battle, versus therapeutic hypothermia, which will add 10 years to your life. <laughs> which is what we're doing all here, right? <laughs> we're we're going to definitely survive longer after spending some time up here. Uh, and this is somebody who's heard me speak before. <clears throat> so now I'm going to get into what we've actually been working on at the Saffir Center. Uh, just to show you how much we love hypothermia, this is a picture I took um, th halfway up the mountain. This is at the Shock Society meeting in June. This is Dr. Saffer and my, some of our techs and fellows. Uh, and Shunren and I took the gondola to the top of the mountain. We were the lazy ones. We're walking down. Walking up the mountain is uh, Peter Saffer, who at the time was about 75 years old. And we met them all in the middle and, of course, found one big patch of snow to take a picture. Uh, but th this, is, this is getting into what we've been working on the Saffir Center, and Pat Kahanek was in the other picture. He's the current director. It's very easy to show in a laboratory animal that if, they're, if you're in hemorrhagic shock as a lab animal, it's good to be cool. So this is just one quick study that we did with pigs, where if they're normal thermic after a prolonged hemorrhagic shock state and resuscitation, they almost all died. They died very quickly. If we cool them with ice cold fluid, thinking we could cool them faster if we use cold or colder fluid, the problem is in shock, this ice cold fluid hit the heart and a couple of them just immediately arrested, so that was bad. But if we cool them a little more gently with surface cooling, room temperature fluid, they almost all survived. One of them had a, a technical error later on. So, and I can show you a whole bunch of that. It's very easy to show in the lab. A little bit of cooling, this is just 34 degrees, is good if you're in hemorrhagic shock. Why is this different than what we see in our patients? Well, our patients are stressed. Our animals are all under anesthesia. They're shivering. Again, patients shiver. Our animals don't. Our, our animals get their own blood back. Humans get blood bank blood. So I don't know really what the answer is, but I've never really convinced anybody to try to do a randomized trial of just a little bit of cooling for trauma patients in shock, which is quite different, though, than the patient who's in cardiac arrest from trauma. So now we're going to get into EPR where we clearly think we need to get much colder. And I'll show you a little bit of data to back that up. After trying to use kind of a closed chest cardiopulmonary bypass circuit to cool the animals, we figured that since, since our patients don't come in with cannulas in place, which makes it a little harder for us, we felt like the easiest thing to do to get cold fluid into the body quickly and also thinking that the only way to get preservation of vital organs is to cool from the arterial side to get the fluid, uh, cold fluid right into the circulation. External cooling is just not going to do it. We decided to work on an intraortic approach. We started with this balloon catheter, but then we just put a big cannula directly into the uh, femoral artery to cool the whole body as quickly as possible. So this is just a, a, a quick diagram of the model where the animals are exsanguinated to the point of no blood flow. We induce V-fib to actually know what time there's actually no blood flow at all. Wait a couple minutes because we figured we can't do this immediately in our patients. And then we just flush them with ice cold fluid on the arterial side and let the venous side just drain out and dump it all out. 
And then we waited, and as you can see here, 15 minutes up to 180 minutes of no blood flow while cold. And then we resuscitated him. Obviously, if they're cold enough, we have to resuscitate with full bypass again. It's just a closed chest bypass circuit to warm him up and reperfuse him. And then we would continue some mild cooling after we resuscitated him, just like we were already doing in our other studies with cardiac arrest. And it's very easy to map out a dose response. If you need 15 minutes of no blood flow, you can do that if you drop the temperature to 34. If you get up to 60 minutes, now you got to get the this is tympanic membrane temperature down to 15, 90 minutes, down to 10 degrees. So we're talking very, very cold temperatures. And we're doing this quickly, 15 and 20 minutes to get down to these kind of temperatures. You guys, 90 minutes, this is the overall performance category, similar to the, uh, the CPC we use clinically now. One is good, five is bad. 90 minutes, they all look good. 120 minutes, they didn't look quite so good. Some neurologic disability. But the logistic problem is it takes a ton of fluid to get the animals this cold that fast. So we wanted to come up with something we could add to the fluid to improve our outcomes without needing quite as much fluid. So this is a simplified diagram that uh, Peter Saffer and Pat Kahana put together. I think they were at a bar like the one here, or at least they were doing some, drinking some red wine. Um, actually, what's on here is scientifically valid. But <laughs> anyway, based on what we thought we knew about brain ischemia and reperfusion, we came up with a list of drugs to try. Bottom line, none of the drugs really did anything. A little bit of benefit of a drug called Tempol, which is an antioxidant. But really, the only thing that works is the cold. And just to show you one more study, of uh, where we actually did a very prolonged shock state, two hours till the animals were rested. This was something that our military uh, supporters wanted us to see, to do. Um, so two hours until they arrested, and we actually randomized them to doing external CPR while we gave them their own blood back versus flushing them with cold fluid and leaving them there with no blood flow for another hour and then coming back and resuscitate them. And you know, when we would do this with this uh, circuitry rest here. We'd go off and have lunch, relax, and come back and resuscitate the animals. Obviously, in patients, we'd be trying to fix them. Here, we actually did add some trauma. We opened the abdomen, injured the spleen, and then later took it out. Well, we found CPR, no good. None of them survived. But CPR with 12 hours of post-arrest mild hypothermia, they mostly survived, but they had some neurologic disabilities. If we prolong that mild hypothermia afterwards to 36 hours, we have better outcomes, which kind of goes back to my point earlier about this 32 to 36 after non-traumatic cardiac arrest. We just got to figure out which patient should be at what temperature and for how long, because we really don't know the answer. But here, the worse the insult, the longer the post-arrest hypothermia needed to be to get better outcomes. So we're not the only ones playing around with this idea. Peter E, Hassan Alam, done some similar work on the direction initially of Lynn Yaffe while they were both in the Navy. They work with this fancy hypothermosol solution. We just use cold saline. Nothing simple. I mean, not, nothing complicated. Just ice cold saline, flushed in the animals, get them cold as fast as possible. They used an open chest model. Uh, but they found a few things that are important. One, that cooling as rapidly as possible was important, which kind of makes sense. I mean, unlike our cardiac surgeons who can time when they start cooling the person and they can time when they're going to clamp off all the circulation, we're stuck with circulation that's already stopped and we've got to do something really fast to try and save the patient. The rewarming, so-so, kind of medium rewarming is necessary. And they also did a study where they had multiple injuries, vascular injury, colonic injury, splenic injury, and they repaired those injuries while the animals were down at 10 degrees. So they showed this could work just like the studies we have done. We've done a little bit of ongoing work with the rat model of EPR. Hassan Alam has done some work with this too. So we're trying to use this to kind of look at more of the mechanisms, the science behind this, because it's, hard, it's uh, hard to do that kind of stuff in a large animal in terms of the expense. So there may be more to come with that. Bottom line, our feeling was that it's time to do a clinical trial. So we call this the Emergency Preservation and Resuscitation of Cardiac Arrest from Trauma, or EPR-CAT trial, which we are currently doing at the Shock Trauma Center at the University of Maryland. Just to tell you a couple of brief things about Baltimore, we're famous for crabs. Uh, we're also famous for Fort McHenry, where the national anthem of the United States was written. Uh, sadly, we're also familiar as, uh, um, famous as one of the homicide capitals of the country at the moment. Uh, so that's a problem, problem for our population. Uh, but what we're trying to do, hopefully, can try to save 
uh, some of these unfortunate trauma victims. So the aims of our trial, rapidly identify patients who could be candidates for EPR within five minutes of pulselessness, because we want to find that fine line between doing it too early, not giving a standard care a chance, versus doing it too late, when it's too late for anything to work. Uh, rapidly induce the EPR with ice cold saline, get the temperature down to 10 degrees. And then after we've gotten some control of the bleeding, rewarm them, reperfuse with full bypass, and hopefully have them survive without neurologic deficits. Right now, we're looking only at penetrating trauma victims, 18 to 65 years of age. They have to have had signs of life present within five minutes of getting to the emergency department for us as the trauma resuscitation unit, or actually arrest right in front of us. And then we open the chest, don't get them back, and we can say, okay, we're going to switch now to EPR. The exclusion is basically the opposite of that, except for we, we right, for the moment, anyway, we don't want anybody with traumatic brain injury, electrical asystole, which means they've been in arrest for too long, obviously non-survivable injuries, massive trauma, pregnancy, and prisoners. And similar to the diagram I showed you for the animals, they're going to lose a pulse, we open the chest, don't get them back, flush the aorta, cool them down, get control of bleeding, and then resuscitate them with bypass. This is just a diagram. We're going to have the chest fully open, so we can put a cannula directly in the aorta to use the cooling flush, and then just drain out the atrial appendage, and then suction it all out so we don't make too much of a mess. We want to have survival without major neurologic deficits. We're going to look at direct complications of what we do, look at coagulopathy, organ failures, long-term survival, long-term neuro, uh, neurologic functional outcome. As you can imagine, it takes a huge team to do this. The trauma surgeons, trauma cessation unit, anesthesiologists, perfusionists, cardiac surgeons, OR staff, cardiac anesthesia, blood bank, all people that do a lot of stuff, but they don't do it all together for the same patient, which is critical here. So we need to do training. We did our first uh, large animal training. This was actually several years before I moved to Baltimore. Uh, to get everyone together and actually do this in a large animal. But we also want to do this with simulation, because if we do a simulation, we can practice this frequently so that when it happens, we're ready to go and everybody's up to speed as to how to do this. So we actually kind of staged this for the BBC. I was doing a whole hour-long thing on hypotherapeutic hypothermia. This is just a few minutes of the program. Uh, but it was actually very useful. That was actually one of our, of our trauma surgeons and uh, one of our fellows helping her out and uh, a couple of our perfusionists. And it was actually very helpful to them to kind of walk through this. And I'll also tell you that I just introduced you to my whole family because the person that had that was my wife, the emergency physician. <laughs> the two medics were our son and daughter and our other daughter were standing there holding a bag and trying to look helpful. <clears throat> so the way we're doing this is if the right patient rolls in, the whole team is there, we can do it. If they're not, we can enroll that patient as a control patient. So we'll have 10 patients who get EPR, 10 who are control patients, and look at the data. We can then go back to all of the regulating agencies and say, hey, we want to change this or that and do another 10 in 10. So that's the way we're doing this feasibility trial. Uh, as you can imagine, there are a whole bunch of regulatory hoops to go through our Food and Drug Administration, Data Safety Monitoring Board, the Institutional Review Board. And in the United States, do a study like this where we clearly cannot get consent from patients we have to do what's called community consultation public disclosure, where we go out to the community and we also make sure we get it out in press releases so people know about what we're doing. Uh, as part of that, you know, once it's out there, it's out there. So the New York Times picked up on this. This, this headline came out my second day of working in Baltimore. <laughs> I quickly met our media relations people. Um, when we did this in, in uh, Baltimore, it was a very, very slow news day. They put us on the front cover of the Baltimore Sun, uh, asking about or commenting on this community consultation. And we also have to give people a way to opt out. They can get this bracelet to wear that shows that they don't want, they don't want Dr. Tisherman to touch them, is what it says. <laughs> in which case, all bets are off. I'm going to need some suction. I'm replacing all of the patient's blood with ice cold saline. Who can tell me why? The theory of cold infusions that can create a temporary suspension of animation. Bingo. That's a man on that table, Leanne. We're going to kill him to save him. The cold infusion. It's an experimental procedure. So, so once things get out into the public, or you can't control them, uh, this is the first patient on the first episode of a TV show co called Code Black, and he's right, hypothermia is an experimental procedure, and that was a man on the table. I will say that patient survived. <laughs> and there was another one on Grey's Anatomy, so I think we're two for two. <laughs> 
Anyway, we are working, we are going forward with this, and I hope I can come back and give you some actual data once we get the study completed. We're also working on ways to make it easier to do this. We have a company, EPR Technologies, uh, which is why there's a patent. I got nothing to do with the company, so I'm not planning to make any money on this, but we want to make it easier for other people to do this if we can show that it works. So to kind of put this all together, non-traumatic cardiac arrest, targeted temperature management, I'm sure something we're all doing in one way, shape, or form. Profound hemorrhagic shock, I would love to do a little cooling with that, but you know, right now is, it's not quite right yet, uh, although it's really easy to show in a laboratory animal. And when it comes to the exsanguinating cardiac arrest patient, uh, EPR hopefully will be the way that we can save them in the future. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, so certainly, you know, who knows what we're going to be doing in the year 2412. I'm not quite sure what, what this is, but, but whatever it is, I'm sure it'll save lives and maybe EPR will be part of that. Thank you very much for allowing me to uh, present this afternoon.